What's up guys? Welcome back to the Next Level channel. Happy Monday, hope you guys are having a good one. Today, we're gonna talk about common mistakes and it's common mistakes 2.0. It's about halfway through the season. I've done a ton of riding clinics, so I've been around a lot of people and seeing a lot of things continually happening. So we're gonna talk about some more common mistakes. Let's get into it. All right, everybody, so our a year ago common mistakes video, maybe it's even been two. Clark, was it last season or the season before that we did that? It was a while ago. The common mistakes video was easily the most viewed video and had the most comments connected to it. And I think it was because it resonated with so many dang people. Well, those were all essentially riding tip common mistakes. And this year, not only am I seeing riding mistakes, but I'm also seeing stuff you know, even before we get riding. So we're gonna go over some other common mistakes in Common Mistakes 2.0. In terms of what we're doing to the snowmobile, you guys have seen plenty of videos of myself and other guys that are out there, um, you know, adding a bunch of stuff to the sled. And, and there is a lot of that where there's a lot of expense to that. Some of the common mistakes that I'm seeing, there's no expense to any of it. Um, and what's funny is that without doing these things and, and remedying these common mistakes, they could end up costing you a lot of money. Awesome. So one mistake, we're gonna just start this off with a mistake that I see that is free. Uh, and it's just easily something that if I have the right tools and I kind of know what I'm doing, we can set the sled up so that it's gonna work better for me. And the first part of that is handlebars. I see all too often people riding the sled with their throttle way up in the air or way too low, or maybe even worse, it's super loose and it's kind of all over the place. I also see people that when I stand up on their sled, I see the way their brake is set up and you know they don't have the brake adjusted properly. And every bit of this, if we got the right tools, we can adjust the brake and the throttle and literally everything onto our handlebars and sort of make it personal to us. So where should the brake be? So as I stand on the snowmobile, having the brake to where my wrist, as my wrist and my arm, my forearm comes down, it's nice that I have my, the angle of the brake set to where I'm not up like this, I don't need to be super low like this, but just in a comfortable position to where this is a position of comfort. Not only that, is it, it's a, a, a position of power. So I've got this like this. If I'm standing up and riding, this feels nice on my arm. I'm not having to tweak my wrist in any way. And on the throttle side, it's very similar. I, I run my throttle nearly level, maybe just a little bit down. And I like having it that way. I feel like as a stand-up rider, I can get good hold on the throttle. And then I've also got that ability, if I needed to, to ever come underneath. And I'm not doing that a lot but I don't want to throttle so out of whack or out of position, nor do I need this thing so dang tight that I can't make little adjustments to it. The other reason that I will leave this throttle block somewhat adjustable is if I ever impacted it. If I ever came into it, the likelihood of it you know, moving versus breaking or even going into me uh, is a lot better with it just a slight bit loose right there. And then obviously we've got the tools to adjust that if that becomes a bit too loose or too tight. So having the right tools, and this is a situation with, with my controls that I get it. A lot of you could just get this set up in your garage, in your shop, and it's kind of set up and you already know about it and you don't need to bring those tools. But remember that there is a lot of times when these things change or maybe need to be changed when I'm out on the hill. So I don't mind having the right tools to make these adjustments with me in the backcountry. All right, so having some, some various Allens, there's, there'll be an Allen in here specific for right underneath a throttle block, a Torx set, having the right Torx to go ahead and make these adjustments so that I can move that brake. Not only am I thinking about the brake in terms of its angle, I'm also wanting that brake lever to be right where it's very comfortable for me to either use my middle finger or my index finger. And a lot of times the way they're set up is the brake is pulled all the way over next to the grip and people are wondering why, well, it's either very difficult for them to get to the brake and then they will choose to not ride with one finger on the brake because it's so difficult to get to. We can adjust that. So we take a Phillips head screwdriver, we move over the brake, uh, sorry, the reverse button, we use a Torx head and we can slide this over. And while we're adjusting for that angle, we're also sliding that over, making it a lot easier for me to get my one finger on the brake. 
So another common mistake, and, and remember guys, that these aren't these like life or death things, right? These are just things that are gonna help better improve our day of riding. And again, having the right tools for the job is gonna make this quick and easy. I think that there are a ton of videos that are out there about track tension. Well, when your track ratchets on you, right? When it's so loose that as you're riding, and it's funny that track tensioning and when it happens, it's usually when you're having this awesome time and you were just so wishing that you made it to the top of the hill and all of a sudden you heard your track ratchet. Remember that's that center cog literally being so loose because the track has loosened up where it's starting to spin and you're hearing that ratcheting sound. Having the right tools to improve track tension, pretty simple. And again, having those tools while you're out there can make that ride that much better. So we'll need a 16 millimeter wrench. I like having the option of having an open end as well as the box, right? Or the closed end, as well as kind of the same deal with a 10 millimeter. So the 16 way Polaris designed that is pretty nice. I need two separate wrenches to make this happen. So the 16 millimeter, you'll come right to here. On, on this side, we'll call this the clutch side of the snowmobile. You're gonna just break this one bolt through all the way through there. That thing will just relieve the tension to the idler wheels. And then you'll take your 10, mil 10 millimeter as well as this same wrench. And as you come in through here, you've gotta pop that jam nut loose with your 16 millimeter. So you'll open that up, get this where this is going to move back and forth here with obviously if we're trying to create some track tension, we want it to move back. Now, when you're in the field, there is some science behind it, but really what you're trying to do is, as I'm gonna go in, right, I'm gonna tighten because I'm trying to tighten the track tension. I wanna come up with a way that as I loosen up the jam nut and I'm running that 10 millimeter, what we often like to do is I will run this 10 millimeter up like this to where it's touching the track. So I'll put this as close up here as I can. And as I start to tighten, I am just doing equidistant turns and I'll count those turns. And typically I'll do something like five, five turns. So if I'm kind of looking at the bottom of the track and I'm trying to tension, I'm doing from the bottom of the track up to where I'm touching again. And I'll do that maybe five, seven times, something like that, just depending on how loose I really feel like the track is. Do the same thing on the other side. Use that 16 millimeter box end, tighten up the jam nuts, and then obviously remember to come back here to this rear axle and tighten it up. And it's not a perfect science. Really what we're trying to do is we want track tension to, to be there, but we don't want it so tight that it feels like it's laboring the motor or slowing it down. And you'll know when you let off the gas if it feels like you've more or less got like an exhaust brake on your sled. Well, a lot of that can be attributed to having a, a track that is just too tight. We'd want our track tension to be nearly as loose as it can be without ratcheting. And so remember that we're gonna do things in sort of a, we're gonna just do, start in small increments and then work up to it. You may not be able to get your track tension dialed on the very first one, but I would start with that five to seven turns somewhere in there. Um, that's been good luck for us so far. So the toolkit I have in my guide sled guys, and I've got tools kind of spread out all over the place, but I just wanted to make reference that this isn't a complete kit, not in any way, shape or form. I've got some tools that are kind of specific to the video. There are quite a bit of tools um, that are specific to a lot of the things on the snowmobile, but some of the key things in terms of the mistakes that we're seeing is having the right tools necessary to do some track tensioning. And the next one would be, and you guys have seen plenty of videos about proper belt deflection time and time again i'm opening up a customer sled and seeing belt deflection where it's just either way too tight or even worse where it's just way too loose and we are robbing ourselves of horsepower so the next one and a common mistake will be belt deflection all right so again common mistake is always always checking belt deflection so every morning we get into the side panel and most of the time we're checking on our engine oil, making sure I've still got a belt in the belt caddy, maybe some spare plugs, and all of it just depending on, you know, the ride from the, the, ride from, uh, the day before or whatever it looks like, but we're repeatedly checking oil of our engine, and then a lot of times I think I see people just doing this number, where they kind of just look there, everything looks normal, and I'm gonna just go ride. Let's remember that kind of inspecting the belt and taking a peek at it, it's a great way to start the day, man. If the day is, uh, to go out there and squeeze the throttle and go have a blast. I want to make sure before I leave the comfort of my shop that all of this stuff is looking right. I don't have any hairs or imperfections on the belt. 
you know, this belt's probably got six, 700 miles on it. So there's definitely some signs of some glazing, you know, and it's wearing out. I think Polaris would recommend, you know, about every 500 miles, just depend on the type of rotting that you're doing. But, you know, it's a wear item. So it'd be something that we'd want to inspect. But to inspect that and then look at the belt deflection, you guys have seen plenty of videos on this to where I want to be able to roll this belt back, which right now my belt deflection is set really, really good. I'm able to move that back between the shivs of both clutches, but it's taken some effort to do so. And that's a great way to just test that that belt deflection is right. When it's too tight, you'll start the sled. The sled will not only idle down, but in some situations it'll start to squeal. And then I'm sure we've all seen where the sled literally wants to kind of go forward on us. And that would be an example of belt deflection set way too tight. Okay. All right, to, to adjust our belt deflection, I need my 11 millimeter as well as my eighth inch Allen. And notice with the tools, guys, I've got an 11, I've got a wrench that's just an 11 and a 10. That's a great, like, sort of space and weight saving setup because there are a lot of situations where I need a 10 millimeter as well. But for belt deflection, the 11 as well as the 8, you guys have seen plenty of videos on belt deflection. I'll use this jam nut here. I use the eighth inch Allen there to get that thing set. Remember that as I loosen that up, you got to kind of think in opposites as I am tightening, as I am turning that Allen in before I set my jam nut, I am opening the shivs up, right? As I open that up, when that belt is sitting in there, that could make the difference of whether it was too, too loose or too tight. Again, if I am loosening it, if I'm pulling it out, I'm actually taking that and tightening, bringing those shivs in. So if I were wanting to tighten up belt deflection, I would be opening those, uh, I would be loosening this and allowing these things to close to get around the belt. So there are so many videos out there about proper belt deflection. It's just having the proper tools and this doesn't always happen when you're at the shop. This may happen while you're out in the field and or if you had to change a belt. If you've got a belt that's got six, 700 miles on it versus a brand new belt, the way this clutch is adjusted, well, it's adjusted and has been adjusted for this belt that's got a lot of miles on it. You put a brand new one on, chances are belt deflection will be out and you'll need to adjust it. Once we know, and remember it's not a perfect science, but once we have an idea that our belt deflection is set right, the clutch panel or the side panel is already off. I've got clear view of my clutch. And I'd also like to point out that anytime I'm near or around the clutch, I would wanna remember that my kill switch and or my key and good practice is to have both of them are turned off or the kill switch is down. Anytime I'm rotating this clutch, remember that, you know, we can primary start our machines, obviously rotating one direction. Let's not lose any fingers while we're doing this. So as I'm inspecting the primary, it's always a good idea and we're, we're always talking about cleaning clutches and all of that stuff. Remember that they're high performance machines. We want them to run better than our buddies. So I'm always inspecting not just the overall condition of the primary, but I'm also looking down in there, looking at the primary spring. Oftentimes, everybody, that primary spring can either be sacked out, like really fatigued, right? Let's remember what it's doing is like at RPM, that thing is just constantly opening and closing, opening and closing. That thing over time can sack out. You know, every few hundred miles, that thing's probably gone through a ton of in and out motion like this and can get fatigued. I've often had them and had one already this year where they break. And when they break, most of the time you can see it, but sometimes you can't. So if you had a situation where you're riding and you had sort of a rapid loss in RPM or the sled just didn't feel right, it didn't idle the same, whatever it looked like, this would be one of the first places I would go and just take a peek in there and make sure that that spring was in good working condition. Carrying a spare primary spring, man, if, you're, if you've are if you already made the 20 something hour trip out west and you were riding on a Sunday and you broke a primary spring, I mean, that's 22 bucks that could make or break your Sunday. And if you didn't have one as a spare and nobody else is open, what a bummer way to, to close out your day. Can you still get out with a broken spring? And the answer is sure, but man, we don't have any more performance just based on that primary spring. All right, within the last week of riding, I've had quite a few people reaching out to me about frozen throttles. And so part of today, once we get into snow, we're gonna be, we're gonna be talking about, once the sled rolls over, the importance of blipping that throttle and getting that snow and ice and debris in and away from that. But let's remember this, because I just had this happen. A guy came in and said, man, my, my throttle, you know, I, I gave it gas, the throttle cable stuck and the, the flipper actually came off the cable. And if he wasn't wearing a tether, well, there went his snowmobile. 
and he was claiming that there was ice bound up inside the throttle cable. I came out to a snowmobile and right underneath here guys where you take this Allen and you come up underneath here to adjust the tension on that throttle block. Let's remember that this throttle block sleeve that's underneath there, if that takes an impact, a lot of times I've seen those because it's happened to me, where they'll actually bounce out of that groove from underneath there. And when that happens, suddenly the throttle gets super loose. And then what a lot of people will do is be like, oh wow, I don't know why my throttle block came loose, but I'm gonna just grab this Allen and go retighten that sucker back up. When you do that, that will oftentimes be the reason why you'll go give it gas. And because it's pinched in there, that's what will happen. And that throttle will stay wide open. So another reason why we're not leaving home without these. So that's just a trick for everybody that keeps thinking that their throttle might be bound up with snow and ice. It might've actually popped out of that sleeve from underneath, which then it's gonna take not only an Allen, but a Phillips head screwdriver, get rid of those four screws that are here, pull this cap off, and you actually have to work that sleeve back out of the throttle block from underneath and then put it back in, tighten everything back up, and then you've got throttle again. All right, lastly guys, as we're kind of rounding out some of these maintenance mistakes that I'm seeing, um, and talking about some tools, you don't, need the, you don't need the entire freaking toolbox, but you need some of this stuff. Remember that as I look around the snowmobile, there are things about a sled that, it'd be one of those things where I'm like, man, I'm so glad that I checked it because it was loose, or, or I didn't check it and I cannot believe I lost a bolt and it fell out. It's usually happening when you're way back there. So don't be afraid as you're kind of getting through the sled and you're, or you're getting through your season. And even though you've got X amount of miles on the sled, know that it's good practice to just go through, take a 13, a 15, a 17. And I get it. I'm talking a lot of stuff that's Polaris or even Axis chassis specific, but there's so much of this that plays a role to no matter what manufacturer your sled you're using. So if there are different wrenches for those uh, particular situations, you know, make sure that you're carrying the right stuff. But a 13 on the low suspension, a 15, a 17, even something as simple as, you know, halfway through your season, check in the wear and tear of your ski rubbers. You know, guys that go out there and they have a damaged ski rubber, and again, it's a Sunday and your ski rubber fails. Riding without a ski rubber, uh, those that have, that have tried it, and I've tried it as well, is an epic fail. And again, that's a, a $10 part, or go to a DuraPro, which is a lot more expensive. Chances are you're not gonna see the failures with those, but it happens, right? And so being able to inspect some of that stuff prior to your ride, I mean, those are some mistakes that I continually see happening and was worth talking about. All right, you guys are noticing that there's a lot of common mistakes that are happening, not on the snow. We're just, before we even leave the shop, the trailhead, the trailer, the truck, whatever it looks like, another common mistake that I see people doing is going out with either no radio, which is a complete mistake as a backcountry rider. You guys know just how quickly our group, especially if we're riding with a large group, can just get scattered. It's like herding cats, especially on a powder day. Everybody just sees the snow, and next thing you know, we're in the trees, and nobody knows where anybody is having radio communication just to keep the group together, right? Let alone a first aid or an avalanche situation be such an ideal tool to have. So as we talk about the, the basic backcountry, you know, the equipment, the stuff that we need, we need a beacon, probe shovel, backpack, and then the radio. So having the radio, making sure that it's charged. You guys have seen the Oxbow stuff that I've been running. The, the radio itself is super loud. It's very easy to change the channels. Let's remember on the Oxbow channel or on the Oxbow radio, I need to push and hold the function button and you'll hear this thing there. That's now padlocked. So as I put this thing up and I get ready to ride, that thing is ready to go. And I'm not going to reach up here as I key the mic and change channels and all of those other things. On the BCAs, still nothing wrong with the BCA radio, but the trick to that is, again, making sure that it's charged. And the other part of that too is when we forget and we leave these things on, you know, you'll key the mic and hear that beeping and it'll actually show red on the mic. Your battery's not working. Well, a not working radio is just like a, a not working transceiver or a not working backpack. Do people still go ride? And the answer is yes. Should they? And should they be responsible? And the answer is, well, when it's a pow day, it seems like people just, what we're willing to go out there and risk when we don't have this stuff working properly. Oftentimes I see people with the BCA because this is now in the backpack or stowed elsewhere. They've got this thing up on their backpack positioned somewhere and halfway through the day they're hearing everybody just fine, batteries charged and then suddenly they're not. Let's remember that oftentimes guys will, they'll either get in between a channel 
So they thought that they were on channel A and now they're kind of stuck here or even worse, they start switching channels and you guys will hear that thing beeping. And a good tip is whatever channel you've set your, your radio up to with you and your group, go ahead and preset your channel A, your channel B and your channel C to the exact same channel. That way, if you do decide to switch channels on yourself, you're still connected with your group. Oftentimes I see people, man, I've been calling for you forever. And you look up and you're like, yeah, it's because you're on the wrong channel. So that's a great tip with the BCAs and with any one of the radios, guys, just making sure that they are fully charged and you're ready for your day riding. All right, so another common mistake is people foregoing the trailhead check and solely relying on a beacon check station. Are beacon check stations good? And the answer is absolutely. I love the fact that there are so many trailheads now that are putting these, these check stations up. Let's remember as we go by the check station, transceiver is, as I stow it away, it's sending out a signal. So as I go by there, the check station is just always in search. So it is picking up that I am sending a signal and it's giving me either I'm not set up properly, that LED X reminding me that something's wrong with my transceiver or it's not even turned on. So it's giving me that X when everything's working properly, it's giving you that green circle saying, yes, it is picking you up in send. A trailhead check, something unique, uniquely different and not something that we should miss or forego. You get your group together and we form a wheel. I am the hub, right? The center of the wheel, everybody to the outside. And since I don't have a group with me, we're just gonna use some open transceivers. These guys have all turned transceivers on, checked battery life. My battery life was 79 today. We're gonna remember that somewhere between that 60 and 70% is we're gonna wanna swap out those batteries. We want great alkaline batteries, full charge. These are life-saving tools and we don't wanna mess around with a, well, with low charge somewhere below that 60 and 70. So each one of these in your group, you'll let everyone know that's on the outside of the wheel to go into search mode. So I'm gonna quickly go around and put these into search. That's in search. Search. Search, and you can go into search as well. Okay, you're in search mode, Steven? Yep. I'm coming towards you, and you are making sure that you're picking me up. And you can see that you are. That making sense? I go around to each person. I can hear those numbers changing. I can see those numbers doing their thing. That one's working. Same thing here. Go ahead and put your transceiver back in send. There you go. I'm going to do the same with all of these guys. Just like this. Just like that. Just like that. So I would ask your group in this trailhead check, everybody go back into send and stow them. So just like they're going riding. Now I'm the only one left with a transceiver out. We've already shown to everybody in the riding group that they can pick me up and send. Now I go to search, verbal confirmation that I'm in search. Guys, I'm in search. Now I'm picking you up because your transceiver is now inside where you've stowed it. You can see I'm picking you up. I'm doing the same thing all the way around, making sure each one of these guys is now sending a signal properly. There they go. Last one. There it is. So now I've checked my whole group and now I'll come up to the last person in the group. I'm gonna go back into send, making sure that that's now sending a signal and go ahead and stow my transceiver. We do that and we do it in that sequence to reduce the variables. You can tell that if we did it the other way, all of a sudden now the three or four people that are in my group could have very easily put their transceiver away and had something change as they put it away. Now everybody can be confident that we have both checked our transceivers in send as well as in search. Then I go by the beacon check station. I should be getting the green zero. If something has changed between now and that time, it's one more reason that we would check it. But a common mistake I see people doing is failing or foregoing the trailhead check.
land. All right. The next common mistake, been happening so much, especially in the last few weeks. We've had a ton of good snow, a lot of deep snow. You guys noticed on the way up, instead of staying neutral, feet back, body forward, just like we talked about in the common mistakes video from earlier, I'm coming up the hill and I feel like I'm gonna be such an anticipated rider that I'm gonna get to this uphill side early. You guys noticed that it didn't matter coming up the hill where I was looking. I'm like looking the direction I wanna go, but my body weight, my body weight being on this uphill side while the sled is still going up, well, with my body weight on this side, what am I telling the sled to do? Go up. And so I'm leaning, I've got my chest forward, I'm looking this direction, but because I've put all that center of mass to that uphill side, here I sit. And this has been such a, a common mistake throughout the season, by far one of my number ones. So the remedy, up the hill, neutral position, we're gonna build momentum coming up the hill. I've gotta wait. I've gotta wait until I can give that sled direction, get committed to either a right side or left side side hill. Once that sled is doing its thing, then I make that transition, get uphill side, set the sled, and boom, side hilling 101. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so significant changes. May not seem like it, but built a lot of momentum, maintain that momentum from where I can get it. All too often I see riders going slower than molasses on the flats. As soon as they hit the hill, it's just like this wide open throttle, trench, lean back, I have no steering. I built that momentum right as I got to that hill as fast as I can go maintain that momentum up on the hill, I have so much momentum and so much time, I'll start to turn that sled in the direction that I wanna start my side hill, and I've got time to make that transition off the gas, get my foot over here, opposite foot forward, get a bit forward on the sled, and then blipping that throttle, setting that sled into the side hill. Now I've taken the steepness out of the hill. So the mistake, the common one is, I get over too early, right? We continually talk about not being a reactive rider, but being an anticipated one. That position and jumping over there too early as we're anticipating being on this side of the sled, but there's timing involved, so we're doing it too early. So hopefully this kind of describes what is happening there. And those of you that are struggling with that, remember that you've got to stay neutral, get committed to that direction, then put yourself into this spot. <sighs> you guys see what I'm doing? Common mistake, here it is again. We did a video that got so many dang views about how to keep our goggles fog free. Well, this is not the answer. How many people, this is your decision. You're just breathing your warm air right into the lens, getting that foam wet, and then sooner or later, our goggles are jacked up, right? Especially on those days, well, when goggles are a necessity. Let's remember that when I'm finished, I'll either leave my, my goggles on my helmet, take my helmet off, or just straight up take the goggles off and then make sure that you place them so that your lens is up and you're trying your best to not get any of that snow and wetness onto the foam. So it brings up another common mistake that I can tell is happening a lot as well, and that is riding too warm. So we're wondering why our goggles keep fogging. And with the introduction of like the heated goggle and some of those things, that's helping a lot. But the idea of wearing a neck sock or a buff, uh, a full blown head sock, I see people taking all this stuff off, their head is just sweating and they kind of seem miserable. Remember that the reason why we're wearing un uninsulated outerwear is so that we can layer. And so right now, I can already tell that I can get rid of one of my shells on the inside here. And you guys will see that I'm wearing this, this puffy jacket here, having the ability to take this thing off, shed this layer, 
and go ahead and go into the tunnel bag or someplace waterproof knowing that, boy, this thing later on, either for the cold trail ride home or in the event I've got to stay overnight or heck, even just be out here for a while, temperatures change, right? You don't like the weather, wait three minutes in a mountain town. It's always changing. So having the layering is smart. The ability to take it off and keep that temperature where you're nearly running cold head cold, a little bit of that cold around us, that's gonna keep that temperature regulated, especially when I'm working hard, keeping those goggles fog free. And overall, you're just feeling better. You're not, you're not sweating. And then later, right, when you don't have all that sweat around you, that's gonna help you stay warm on your trip out. All right. Well, once again, guys, big thanks. Hope you liked the video. We are, we're getting dang close to 40,000 subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so, you guys. That just really shows us that support and it allows us to get out here and, and build future videos. Hope you guys like this one. The common mistakes for us, we see it all the time. There's definitely a lot more than what I've even showed you today, but hopefully this is kind of a run through and it hits home with a lot of you of just things that I see that are happening both on and off the snow. You guys remember, checking out your sled, making sure that the, the quality of your day, the ride, can be just about these few maintenance items that we're seeing, protect ourselves, wearing a tether, radio, doing that transceiver check, making sure that your group is connected that way. And then obviously the riding techniques part of it, just go out there with the idea that it's about quality and not about quantity, right? We can continue to just go go out onto a snowmobile and do these things over and over and over and doing them incorrectly. And all we're doing is stacking bad muscle memory. So come out here, utilize these videos, start doing right, leave those questions and comments, and we'll see you next time.